Hi, everybody, and welcome to One Question with Pastor Adam. And I am Adam, and I am pastor to believers and to doubters, to unfaithful Christians and to faithful atheists. And friends, Jesus was not afraid of questions, and so neither are we here at One Question. We are going to uh, go over some of the big important questions when it comes to faith, the Bible, uh, all, all the questions that you have about God. And today we have uh, one of the most important questions. Hi, Dina. It is good to see you. One of the most important questions for me and for us, which has to do with God and violence. What do we do with the violence in the Bible? Many people have rejected the Bible because we have been told that it is hopelessly violent. Do you feel that? Do you feel that? Some of us like uh, feel that really deep. What do you do with all of the violence in the Bible? Last week, we talked about this, the historical interpretations of the Bible and how varied and how multiple they are. We tend to think that, well, uh, you have to interpret the Bible in one way. And if the Bible says that God is violent and does these violent things, then that has to be the case. Well, we learned last week as we talked about ancient historical biblical interpretation uh, that that the church, the that Christianity has had multiple interpretations of the violence in the Bible in light of the revelation of Jesus Christ, and also in light of the revelation that the Bible is doing in and of itself, the Bible that helps to form Jesus. Now, uh, I love to bring on people to talk about this so that you know I'm not just making it up, right? <laughs> so so today I have brought on, hey, Jose, good to see you, and Dina and Melanie and Dina. And friends, if you've got questions about this topic, please, or comments, please put those in the chat section because uh, we want to bring those in too. So um, today I I am honored, uh, overjoyed to bring onto the podcast one of my dear friends, uh, Tony Bartlett. Tony Bartlett and I, I met Tony about 15 years ago at uh, conferences that are centered around the very question that we are talking about today. I think it was a theology and peace conference where I first learned uh, or first met Tony. And uh, Tony is such a, a wonderful man, a nice man doing incredible work on theology, the Bible, and nonviolence. And uh, Tony is one of those people that just exudes all of this beauty and wonder. <laughs> I am totally embarrassing him, which is awesome. That's what I want to do. So I'm going to bring him in and uh, talk to you uh, about some of his books. So uh, here comes Tony now. Hi, Tony. Hi there, Adam. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful introduction. Welcome. Um, welcome I, to I'm the show. I'm partly embarrassed, but my natural... Um, Hubris says yes. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I love you, Tony. You are you are just amazing. I love it. So I want to introduce you to uh, Tony's books. Uh, Tony, I believe your first book. This is this is going to get people jazzed right here. Your first book, I think, right, is Cross Purposes. Uh, this book, uh, Tony's titles and subtitles are just amazing. The Violent Grammar of Christian Atonement. And uh, Tony goes through atonement theories uh, and is, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about this book, Tony? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I wrote that book in uh, uh, 1999 to 2000, directly after my, I did my dissertation uh, here in uh, Syracuse University. And um, it kind of resulted from uh, the fact that I had been a, a Roman Catholic priest which I, I'll probably mention again as, as we go forward, but uh, I was always bothered by this whole thing about Jesus dying and how his death uh, for, somehow or other forgave our sins. Mm. The result of that was the forgiveness of our sins. And I remember very distinctly in, in seminary, I already had a question in my head about it, and I was looking forward to the Christian doctrine uh, course that I was taking and the particular lecture. It was only one lecture that we were doing on this. 
And I said, well, I'm going to get an answer now of, of what, because everything kind of pivots around Jesus' death, of course, both in the Gospels yeah. and in Paul's, Paul's teaching. But the whole thing is, and, and I waited for the, the professor to come up with the answer. And he says, there are three answers, basically three answers. We don't want to go through it. And then none of them are really good. And that was the end of the lecture. <laughs> So you you give us the good answer in the book. Well, I so, hope so. I, right? it, it was all, it always bugged me, you know. Like there's got to be a better answer to, to stuff out there. Yeah. And of course, we'll get on to it as well. Rene Girard, the figure of Rene Girard, was hugely important in in helping create an answer. Well, beautiful, all awesome. I love it. And then uh, other books, virtually Christian, uh, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Tony, you you wrote in this for me. I don't know if you can see it there, but you say signed copy to my dear brother and companion yeah. in the very in the faith. Uh, remember a way uh, I can't read the rest of it. Your handwriting wasn't very good back then, Tony, but <laughs> I love you for it. And uh, it's, this is another fantastic book, Virtually Christian. Uh, and then you dive into Pascal's Wager into some uh, into some uh, fiction. Uh, and so that's a lot of fun. And last week I mentioned we talked about uh, the Bible and interpretation, nonviolent interpretations of the Bible. And some people were asking for resources. One of the best resources that you can get on uh, learning the Bible and uh, how it reveals the nonviolence of God and moves us in that direction is a book called Seven Stories how to study and teach the nonviolent Bible. I go back to this very frequently, especially Tony has a chapter in this Bible on God's uh, wrath in the Bible that is incredibly helpful for helping us understand what the Bible means by God's wrath. So um, Tony, you want to give us like, this is totally not fair. Give us like the two minute explanation of wrath in the Bible. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, well, wrath is, is quite a feature in, in the Bible and <laughs> It, it um, it's an anthropological thing, and, and when I say anthropological, it belongs to the character of of human beings as such. I, you know, you can translate it very simply as violence, but we're talking about very often it's the wrath of God, and therefore the the violence of God, and it's it's kind of like basically the violence packed into religion when it kind of cuts loose uh, in terms of. Attacking an enemy or, or attacking, uh, and, and it would be a kind of tribal enemy. It would be an enemy of the people. But also uh, when in, in the story of the, um, the chosen people, when they went into exile uh, in the 6th century, it was very much interpreted as something that was inflicted on them. So they had experienced the, the wrath of God, um, uh, and uh, had, which had been promised basically by the by the prophets, this is going to happen. God is is angry with you, and there will be um, there will be violence to pay. There will be there will be a violent uh, outcome of all this. So, it's kind of deeply embedded in in both the human experience and and then the biblical experience. And um, in in you know, I, I do talk about it in terms of um, uh, in uh, signs of change in terms of, of the prophet Amos. Amos probably is the one of the first ones to uh, kind of stress it or to articulate it in respect. He says, because because I have chosen you, this is a passage from Amos, because I have chosen you uh, from all the, the tribes of the earth, uh, you I will punish. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, like, like because you are special to me, I'm going to punish you. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's this kind of mixed up, conflictive feeling about the God of the Bible in in that tradition, in that, in that respect of, of the, those sayings and that, that evolving uh, sense of who God is in 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 the prophets, and then, as I say, especially in the exile. So it becomes it's definitely a theme, and it's something that then is taken up in Christianity. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk more about that when we get to signs of change. The next book is Theology Beyond Beyond Metaphysics: Transformative uh -huh. Semiotics of Rene Girard. Uh, right. I've got that on my Kindle. So. Um, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit more, more about Rene Girard, uh, I'm sure, as we uh, go along, because Girard has uh, influenced both of us uh, on right, how we understand so. the Bible. That's why we, why we met, really. 
Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And then Tony's latest book, I love it, is called Signs of Change, the Bible's Evolution of Divine Nonviolence. Uh, and so that's what we are here to talk about today. So friends, if you have uh, comments or questions about this, would love for you to put those in the chat section and we will bring those in. Uh, hey, Chandon from uh, India. Welcome uh, from Life Changing Church and Heal the Nations Network. I love it. Chandon, uh, welcome, welcome. So, uh, Tony, uh, your latest book here, uh, I read through it. I've got a lot of notes in it, uh, as you can see. Um, why did you write Signs of Change, the Bible's Evolution of Divine Nonviolence? Uh, great question. Like all Adam's questions are really good. Uh, the, the, this first one here is, is very uh, significant because it has it has a significant answer. Um uh, I already touched on it in terms of when I was a priest and not really understanding um, the, that pivotal doctrine of, of Christ died for us and for our sins. Um, so I came to the United States in 1993, specifically to go to the Department of Religion in Syracuse. And uh, although you, you're not supposed to really have decided in advance, I really had it fixed in my mind that I wanted to write my dissertation on the question of atonement. And atonement is a kind of heavy laden word. And, you know, in English, uh, it basically means to put things right um, with someone you've offended or with uh, the society, make atonement uh, for, for your crime, et cetera, and go to jail, like the common usage. But of course, Originally, it just means at one month. It means reconciliation coming together. It doesn't mean to pay off um, uh, an offended party. But that's what it came to mean, and, and largely through Christian uh, teaching that, that, uh, that emerged in the Middle Ages, in the uh, early Middle, or relatively, relatively early middle, middle Ages in the uh, 11th century, the end of the 11th, 11th century, and in Cross Purposes, my first book, which resulted from that dissertation, uh, I, I, I show how the Crusades, the, uh, the origin of the Crusades and the mobilization of the Crusades, you know, to get that number of people together and yeah. all head off to Jerusalem to, to attack the, the Muslims uh, and the doctrine of the compensation of an offended God um, both of those arose simultaneously, and it's not an accident. <laughs> In other words, the the, the, the kind of um, the the kind of militarization or the um, making violent or more violent of Christianity all happened then at that point, and it came out of militarized uh, society, uh, out of out of um, uh, uh, kind of uh, military order society, the knights, the the um, you know the the noble chivalrous knights that, that we're so used to from the from the Arthurian legends and all that kind of stuff. But that's very that is all very military and violent. And uh, all these these doctrines came out of that, or the doctrine of atonement came out of that. So I came to the United States and I studied all this and, uh, and wrote it in and uh, became that book. But that's a very critical viewpoint. It's a, a critical deconstructive viewpoint. It kind of tries to take apart and take down very deliberately tries to take down that concept of God, God's honor, in specifically from Anselm, God's sense of honor, his, his and I say his advisedly because of the, the medieval context and, and the, the worldview at that time, uh, his honor needed to be compensated mm. because e even the slightest sin was an infinite uh, offense against the honor of God. And, and honor is... See, honor is not really in the Bible, but it's definitely part of the feudal mindset. And so it, it, then it got kind of fed into, it got kind of, kind of um, folded into the uh, Christian mindset. And uh, so I, I, I did my best to take it apart. And I was I was in a good place in Syracuse University in the Department of Religion. It was a very deconstructive, postmodern kind of place. And it, it, was, it was a congenial environment in which to do that. But that left a big kind of hole <laughs> because... Mm. You know, if you take apart an old way of looking at things, and I wasn't the first to do it, and um, and even even at the time I was doing it, some a number of other people were working on it, but still, um, 
I was I was part of that, and it kind of leaves a kind of space uh, uh, that that is not there's not a, a clear answer there. So I was always conscious that you, you kind of need to tell you know, need to give another account, uh, and and it needs to be as substantive and as um, uh, formative. I, I I hope as as that old account that really lasted a thousand years, and it's got so. So it, it is responsible so, so much for the kind of, um, you know, the militarization and the and the and the the violent mindset of of, of yep. the Christian religion in so many respects. So I was always aware that I, there needed to be another account, and that kind of a, that the way that emerged was um, over the past twenty years, doing Bible study in our in the local community that that I'm I'm part of and that I, you know, I help run. Um, it's called um, Used to be called Wood Hath Hope, but now it's called the Bethany Center for Nonviolent Theology and Spirituality. Uh, and little by little, um, a kind of understanding, a connected narrative of the scriptures of the Bible began to emerge. And along with that, the sense that, and this is this is where it gets a little technical and goes back to the other book beforehand, René Girard, the, the transformative semiotics, uh, René Girard. But the simple way of saying it is that. I mean, every every human being loves stories. We all love stories. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many stories surrounding us, and and of course, in the era of movies, um, you know, they, we we have so many stories in, in in common, and we have these universes, the Marvel universe, the DC university, like they 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 build this collective universe that people could almost inhabit. So it's very human thing to belong to have stories in common and to belong to stories and no stories to interpret our world and and that's the really the basically the way in which i i understood the bible that the bible was a series of connected stories that was an interpretation of our world an interpretation of god and and, and of course god has an agency in that god is not a passive observer but very much an agent in in transforming our story but that's really what's happening our core story as human beings is being transformed in the bible and of course another way of saying story is signs because stories are made up of signs, images, and words, com communicative instruments that uh, allow us into a story or a narrative, a picture of the world. And I said, you know, Girard um, had uh, uh, part of his, th his thinking was that uh, the origin of signs, the origin of, of human meaning and storytelling, myths, as we called them way back, is out of a uh, kind of uh, terrible events of original violence, uh, collective violence against uh, 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 a single individual, a victim. And that's where our humanity comes from. It's a very startling theory. I'm sure Adam has talked about it before. Um, but then, and, and I kind of, I, I brought some of that, that thought with me, but I studied it more when I, when I came to the United States. Uh, and then, you know, it becomes very logical and also um, deeply meaningful if you say, well, that's our original story and it comes out of original violence. If God is reaching out into our world, uh, coming coming at the world sideways, not right for, from the very beginning where it's mm -hmm. kind of confused whether God is part of that original violence or not, He's coming sideways like to Abraham or especially to Moses, I am who I am, and tell them I am has sent you. No, he's coming to the to a to an oppressed people and he's heard their cry. If God comes into the world in that way to uh, make a big difference, is he, what, what what is he, she, they, God going to yes. do? But but change the story and change it basically on that level of collective violence against the sing single individual and have someone who who can turn that around and turn it into love mm. so that's 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 really why i wrote the book it's a long-winded way of saying it to complete the art from taking apart the old story the anselmian story of god's offended honor and putting a new uh, much more much more satisfying and loving and, mm. and transformative story of god actually changing our story, changing yeah. our, our war story. 
Yeah. Yeah. So uh, really this um, kind of a, atonement theory of uh, satisfying God's honor gets, right. gets moved into satisfying God's uh, wrath a little later on with the mm -hmm. Protestants uh, begins a thousand years uh, into Christianity. And so before this, I always like to tell people that, uh, you know, if you want to talk about atonement or at one mint, uh, maybe like there were a bunch of formulations before this. My favorite, um, I don't know if you have a favorite, uh, is Athanasius, uh, where Athanasius says like, uh, the formula is that the reason that God became human was to make humans godlike, <laughs> was mm -hmm. to invite us into the oneness of God, which just feels so much better. To, it's much more incarnational. Like Jesus is uh, the fully divine, fully human one uh, come to us, as you say, like sideways um, <laughs> into the story uh, and reveals the utter nonviolence, the radical love, uh, turning the other cheek, love even those that you call your enemies. This yeah. is what God is fundamentally like. Uh, mm. And so inviting us into that kind of life and um, deconstructing that is the, not that, but deconstructing what comes after a thousand years and 16, 1700 years later, uh, which has formed us so much is so important. So you are doing fantastic work. Um, and I'm always grateful for it. Uh, Wesley says loved Pascal's wager. Tony, do you have another, oh, really? fiction? do you have another Where's... fiction coming out? <laughs> I do. Well, thank you, Wesley. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I still have to, uh, finish the, sequel to that but I, I feel okay about delaying it because a sequel is a sequel you know and, and, and you can wait 20 years to, right. to get it but it I mean I have it I have it kind of on the on the, the stocks kind of thing and uh um uh and I will complete it thank you Wesley I will I will do it and I'll you'll be one of the first to know Awesome. We will we will keep our eyes out for it. Dina asks the the question that we are going to get at, Dina. So here we go. How do you go from kill everything down to the last blade of grass and you've disobeyed and must suffer to Yeshua's message of loving all and turning the other cheek? <laughs> This, this Dina, you got it. This, this signs of change is, yeah. is going to help us answer this question. This is, yeah. this is Tony. Tony, I believe this is probably like your life's mission is to answer is. this kind of question. It is. And I, I didn't realize it was my life mission at first, but it, it has become apparent, you know, uh, looking back. I mean, I suppose we only understand our lives looking back, but that, that is the case. I think it is my life mission to, to answer that question and it's a very very obvious question coming out of the bible because in in chapter six of genesis right off the bat you know <laughs> god wipes out everything you know with this massive flood and and it's got to include the animals and the birds everything and um i suppose he left the bacteria alive but they didn't they didn't know much about it at that that point um and then how so how do you get from that to the um the non-retaliation, the mercy, and the non-violence of Jesus. Yes, that's that's the question. And you want me you want me to answer? It? <laughs> well, well, okay. So uh, you go through in the book. Uh, you have different chapters. Yes, uh, yeah. on different books of the Bible. Uh, yeah. So you do Exodus, Genesis, Job, the Suffering Servant, Ruth, Daniel, Jonah, Jesus, and Paul. And you're teasing out uh, maybe these different strands within within the Bible. Would that be fair to say? Yes. I mean, the point, Dina, is that the Bible represents, and I, I, this is very broad and general, but I think it's true. The Bible equally represents the infancy of humanity as well as its possible maturity. You know, mm. the Bible is 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 a complete document and it intends to be. So, I mean, if, if you read those first chapters of um, Genesis, uh, excluding chapter one, which is this beautiful seven day creation account, very majestic, wonderful, very consoling, because it says every it keeps saying over and over again, everything is good. It's like what you tell a child if the child is, is upset, you know, it's OK. So it's all good. It's going to work. 
And that that's what Genesis chapter one tells us. But then you go from chapter two and it's all kind of like goes to hell in the handbasket there all the way through to chapter 11. And God behaves so poorly. I mean, I'm going to say badly, but poorly. You know, he, he's just reactive and 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 rivalrous, the same as every human being. You know, what if, if they've built this town, what are they going to do next? So we have to stop them, you know, I you know, and, and it's a kind of we. Um, so there, there's some kind of collective identity of God that that and that would kind of probably translate the Elohim, the, the, the gods in the plural there in that in that traditional name of God. Um, but God is so reactive and punitive and small minded. <laughs> and then in chapter 12, suddenly he, he gets a plan <laughs> and, and he says, OK, here you are, Abraham. I'm choosing you. And I want you just to get up and go and go to a land I will show you, which is very wonderful because Abraham has faith. He doesn't see. He believes. And in you, all the tribes of the earth are going to be blessed. So God switches, turns on a dime from wiping out everything to say, I'm going to bless everybody. Mm. Mm. And I don't think that that contradiction or that dissonance is there by accident. It's there to make us think. The writers of Genesis put that stuff together, and then the sequence of Genesis going on from chapter 11 through the patriarchs all the way to, to Joseph, who creates this wonderful story, this, this kind of epic of salvation, really, for, for, for the hated Egyptians. And, and, you know, this has all been written down way after the actual events of the Exodus. So they know that Exodus is coming up next. The book of Exodus is coming up next in the way it's all put together. But they put this narrative of the blessing and the immense blessing of the Egyptians, and 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 really the kind of um, um, the, the 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 salvation of its social order. You know, it's not just feeding; it's like everything is put right somehow or other. And so that that the the, the book of Genesis is written, I think, and this only became obvious, I think, as you look as you're seeking an answer to all these these disconnects. Um, and and uh, contradictions, and and you say, well, you know, they did this deliberately. They're not stupid. <laughs> I mean, they're not putting this stuff out yeah. there because they are uh, mindlessly stitching uh, elements together. There's there's a a questioning, purposeful, and salvific nature to those paradoxes. In other words, the book is telling us and is telling the people, you've got to. You've got to seek this answer further. You've got to follow where this God is going to lead you. Because there's this first bit of the story, which is intensely human, which is all to do with the way you construct your reality. And then God comes in sideways, like I say, obliquely to say, okay, God, okay, Abraham, you better set off now because this is the beginning of a journey to something radically new for human beings. I love it. So, I love it. It reminds me, who was it that said uh, God created humans in God's image and humans have been returning the favor ever since? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Remember? It's like yeah. it, it, we project our uh, our violence onto God uh, and and have this sense that uh, God is caught up in our violence. And I think that's what is being teased out in those beginning chapters of Genesis. As you say, like in the beginning, God creates everything and it is good. And then we start misunderstanding God and God getting wrapped up in our violence. And pretty soon we're in an apocalyptic era where we could destroy ourselves and God gets yeah. caught up in that. Yeah. And at the end of the flood, God's like, uh, whoops, like that was a bad idea. Not going to do that again. <laughs> right. Yeah. He just says that. I mean, they, what? You're, right? God. You're, supposed, you're supposed to know this in advance. <laughs> this is it. This So Dina is, is getting at this question. Does God evolve and mature with humanity or does God uh, show itself as humans can accept God? Uh, this, this all depends on if you are a classic theologian or a process theologian, I guess. <laughs> But there's well, there's a lot going on there with the character. There is a lot going on, and there's something unfathomable about it. But I mean, if you inspect your own heart, and I suppose you know, like Christians do this, you know, that we we discern the spirit uh, of love. We know there's something eternal about love. Um, 
you know, in your own life, in our own lives, when when things go go wrong somehow, or or you feel bad about yourself uh, for whatever reason, um, if if you know you've you've gone, you've traveled the journey enough, gone along the road enough, you know that God is always going to be there, and you will always be able to return to that love. So there's a, there's something you know perennial as the as the grass kind of thing. You know, like it's always there. So it's I would I would say it's more like the the lesson of love is hard to learn. Yeah. It's hard to learn for defensive, aggressive, um, kind of like molecular beings, small molecular beings that we are, little amoeba crawling around the surface of the, the planet, whatever. It but 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 we can learn. We are teachable. I mean that's the whole thing. So it's really it's more it's more more being taught um, this incredible uh, new story, uh, and and then understanding God progressively as we go along. And of course, in your own life, that that would be the case. You know, the um, in the contemplative life, you know, there are various stages, and, and you get to this kind of higher, so called higher, but the unitive level where you're one with God. Um, you have you have to go on this journey. There, there's stuff that you leave behind, and you. I used to see things one way. We know when I was a child, I spoke as a child. Now I, I, I think as, a, as, as an adult, a grown up. So I, I think it's the human journey, and I think the Bible, and especially Genesis, which I see is 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 this marvelous work of art, right at the very masterpiece, really, of literature, right at the very beginning of the Bible, as very much teaching us. Um, that the the the, you, the 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 sense of God, that the identity of God, has to be learned progressively, and it comes out of violence. You see, I mean, I think that's what those first chapters tell us that you know God is muddled up with violence at the beginning, but that's because of us. That's because of the way we, um, as Adam uh, Adam says, um, we we return the favor. And uh, what what is it in Jurassic Park? <laughs> <laughs> where a guy says, you know, God made human beings and human beings made dinosaurs. Or no, then he, God wiped out, wiped out the dinosaurs and then human beings made dinosaurs and then the dinosaurs wipe, wipe out the planet kind of thing. You know, like mm -hmm. we, we, we um, if, if we are left, if we follow through that primitive uh, uh, identity of humanity, then we will wipe out the planet. You know, yeah. and there's so many movies are, are about that. But there's this, maturing identity maturing human identity i mean i think that's what the bible is about is a maturing human identity and when you get to jesus you're looking at the, the at the human one at the fully human one and mm -hmm. uh, um and of course that you know when we, we talk about we, we, we would have a chance to talk about daniel the, the, the one like a son of man one like a human being you know that that I, I say is a very important meaning of that that phrase. So you so you're 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 looking at an evolving humanity, and that's the kind of beauty of of what Gerard has made possible for us by by seeing our original violence, our founding violence, and then okay, well we better we better see the Bible in that light and see how the Bible and, and Gerard already said the Bible reveals this. I mean, by, by, uh, that's one of the reasons why. You know, Gerard is very um, uh, easy to uh, to integrate with 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 biblical studies and, and the biblical narrative. But he says the Bible uh, reveals his original violence, especially in figures like um, uh, Abel and and Joseph and Job, and then of course Jesus. Um, and so, if the Bible is doing that, it's obviously a progressive narrative. And that's the whole point about, you know, when you go to, I, I would say that when you go to seminary, <laughs> that's what you should be learning. You should be learning this progressive narrative and you should be integrating it. You should begin, you begin to understand it at a deeper, deeper personal level. So then you could lead others into it, you know, not this kind of fixed monolithic, very Greek in kind of origins that, you know, we know metaphysically the origins of um, being and, and God. And the ident and the uh, metaphysical identity of God, so it's all fixed there in the beginning, and and then you merge Bible with that, and then it becomes highly perplexing, and so you have to have a an authoritative, authoritative church 
to sort out your problems and say, well, this mm. is the answer. And if you say anything against it, I will, I will execute you. And then you have a Protestant Reformation, which basically kind of um, does not resolve the issue of the violence in God. Uh, in some ways hypes it up because you know like the, the wrath of god is is now very personal against you but it provides a solution in terms of your act of faith that you're good you know you're going to be saved but it doesn't do anything to transform the whole picture you know mm. it, it it the the whole picture of a violent identity of god just grinds on and we and we have the you know the 20th century and the 21st century and all these, all the wars Yep. Yep. Uh, Annalise says when the Bible is used to rule over others, it is used in a violent way. When it is used to spread love and compassion, it is a tool for peace. I guess it reflects humanity more than God in that aspect. This is right. where you were getting at Abraham and Sarah and the yeah. divine mission, the invitation to go be a blessing to all the right. families of the earth. And you put it so beautifully when uh, this is also like, hello, we're going to go to Egypt here pretty soon. And this includes the Egyptians. Yes, uh, it does. We've got the Assyrians who are going to come and conquer us. And hey, we are called to be blessings to the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Romans. Very much so. Because if you think that Genesis is being written, yes, the story goes back. But when does it get written? It gets written precisely in that period after the Assyrians. And of course, Jonah, the story of Jonah is about the Assyrians. So the jo Jonah says, you know, God loves the Assyrians and, and the Babylonians. So you're the when all this is being written and conflated, um, uh, brought together into the Torah. So you've got the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you know, that that crucial teaching, the Torah. All this is put together. In that time, in that time frame, that sixth century, and it's got a lot to do with loving your enemy. Yes, yes, it has. Mm, mm. So uh, people often say Jesus is just making up this love your enemy stuff, but <laughs> he gets it from the Bible, or he gets it from the his scriptures. Absolutely, because you know you've got Second Isaiah and the return from exile, and he says, um, um, uh. Uh, I mean, the various passages, but they, they, they accent this compassion of God for a brief moment. My, I, 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 I hit you or I afflicted you with my overflowing wrath and he uses it. But now with everlasting compassion, uh, I will love you. Mm. So so there's it, 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 there's a transition happening there in, in the in the book of Second Isaiah, which sees which begins to see more clearly. Um, and then you have the figure of the servant in there who is a figure supremely of non-retaliation, non-violence, who, who says, and and um, the prophet and, and, and God through the prophet is saying, my servant, through his knowledge, what is that knowledge? This is his transformed understanding of what God is, is going to make many righteous. So that's there, that's there 12 centuries after uh that's there six centuries after Moses, but then six centuries before Jesus. And then you've got to go on down to Jesus. And this is a slow percolation of this of this truth, which has taken us Christians basically 2,000 years. <laughs> you know, like if it took them, should we say it took Jesus yeah. 1,200 years to get it from Moses, should we say, roughly speaking. You know, we've it's taken us 2,000 years because, you know, like we we haven't had this long nurturing and you know, sculpting in the word that that the the the, the Hebrews, the Jews did, and or, or certainly elements among them, but it's still it is actually happening, and I think that the word does that. You know, the word is this wonderful retelling of our human story. At the same time, it's not just a kind of like a childish retelling. When that story is retold at that level, it does something to us it evokes a different response in us it, it, it changes us and it makes us new kinds of, of human beings mm, yeah yeah i love it uh um so we've got a question in here about uh job and i know you've got a chapter on job can you just tell us a little bit about how you see this uh moving on in in the book of job 
Well, Job's very important, and all this stuff is coming um, together uh, round about the the sixth century to the fifth century, um, the fourth century. This is when Judaism, as such, is being formed. Beforehand, you had Israel, and before before that, you had the Hebrews. <laughs> so you got really three names mm. for the chosen people. And I, I remember asking that in in seminary. I said, "Why?" Why are there two names here, Hebrew? I said I didn't think of three. I said why are there two names here, Hebrews and is and Israel? And my professor once again said, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's because this the research and the understanding is 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 coming online lately. You know, there's been a lot of biblical research and and um, kind of anthropological understanding you know, through Girard. So the answers are more are more available now than they were uh, back when I was in seminary. Um, but anyway, Job, Job is probably written in the Persian period. I mean, can't be certain. There's nothing, there's no precise indication, but it does seem to be written in the Persian period. That is uh, after the return from exile. And it very much reflects this question, very, very powerfully reflects the question. If you're suffering, if, if bad stuff is happening to you, like it happened to, to Job, I mean, he progressively loses everything. Yeah. He sits on the dunghill, scraping his sores, and his wife says, come on, get this over with. I'm really, really, I want to marry somebody else, basically. I mean, you're mm. a disgrace. She says, curse God and be damned kind of thing. But he doesn't. He says, there's something wrong with the equation. You're blaming, you're saying that I've done something wrong, and this is the, at the root of my suffering. No, the question is wrong. The understanding of that sequence, personal suffering, a sin beforehand, you did something to merit it, the kind of karma thing, there's something wrong with that. So he asks that question very profoundly. And I learned this from a, a race, basically a Jewish woman. Mm. It was an online too. She just, she just hit. And I won't mention her name here. She's she's around and she will be embarrassed to find this. I will tell her. But she when I was talking about Deuteronomy and, and of course, Job is in my book. I, I said Job is a counter to Deuteronomy. Yes. So that you've got this complex narrative going ahead, really a conversation or an argument and various inputs about the, the meaning and identity of God and the relationship with God. So uh, Deuteronomy is written right out of the experience of of the exile and it says in chapter 28 that if you keep this rule these set of rules and keep my my covenant which moses himself is proclaiming this this book is three first-hand speeches of moses so you feel very much you're there at the feet of moses and moses is, you've got the authority of moses it's 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 again a work of art, you know. It's a work of of um, construction. It's, it constructs your identity with these words coming from the figure of Moses. But it says if you do, if you if you keep these rules, everything will be good. You'll be blessed. The harvest will be good. You won't there won't be locusts. Your children will be happy. They'll thrive. If you don't, the reverse will happen. And with knobs on. You know, like mm -hmm. that, that everybody will die, the crops will fail, um, locusts will come, and then a nasty, nasty nation from way, way off to the north, they said, but basically it was the north and east, uh, will come and it will take you off into captivity and your name will be used as a curse, as a, as a, um, uh, as a slight because everybody will despise you. Um, and, and, this, and this will be, this will happen because you have sinned. Because you broke it, the, so there's there's this kind of very um, violent um, uh, retaliatory th theology arises out of the exile, and I'm because I'm claiming that this is written directly after the exile. You know, I'm 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 saying historically, critically, this is written after the exile. It's not written back at the time of most. It's written off the exit, and obviously it makes sense. It's try it is trying to make sense of what's happened. Yeah. The amazing thing is, is that in this disaster that has taken place, they've lost their land, they've lost the temple, they lost their king, everything is wiped out. 
the Babylonian, Babylonians are absolutely assertive. They are triumphant. And in that condition, <laughs> and out of that condition, the relationship is preserved. It's not, it doesn't strike one as a very healthy relationship, but it does say in, what is it, chapter 6, you, Hear, O Israel, um, the Lord your God is one. You should love your, the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole strength, your whole, your whole life. Um, and Jesus um, echoes that. He affirms it in the Gospels. So that core relationship is there, but it's understood punitively. <laughs> the, over, the, the, the historical context is one of incredible punishment and yeah. punishments. It, it almost feels like um, sometimes God is depicted, and this is, I think, us making God in particularly a patriarchal male culture. Yeah. Uh, an abusive husband is often how God feels as you, yeah. as you read these stories. Um, you better do what I say or I'm going to punish you. And yeah. Job is here as uh, a kind of a deconstruction of a, that a kind of very, theology, right? very powerful subversive, deep, radical deconstruction of that because Job never quits. He yeah. never quits. He keeps on saying, you know, I'm innocent and I need to have my day in court with God because I want to ask him personally, why did you do this? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the book, going through this in, 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 marvelous, in, in, in these marvelous sequence of chapters, God says, um, I'm angry i mean this is something that i mean i never really it was jim williams who first alerted me to this i never read that bit at the end um god said i'm angry with you the companions of job because you did not speak correctly about me unlike my so my servant job who did so everything job says is vindicated so the book turns deuteronomy on its head Yes. So the, the companions of Job are the ones who use religion, like laws and stuff, as an excuse to scapegoat, to blame Job. And Job holds on to his innocence. And yeah, at the right. end, so whenever you use religion as an excuse to like accuse someone or say you're not you're not doing you're not living out God's laws and this is why bad things are happening to you. Yeah. Uh, if God is angry at anyone, God, that's where God's anger is. Like yes, using right. Using God as an excuse to attack other people. Get, if anything gets God angry, that's it, right? <laughs> and it's it's just the marvelous freedom and creative, I won't say license, because I think there's a logic in it. It's not just yeah. license. It's creative uh, spirit or, or or power in the Bible. Like, you know, you get that in Genesis where you have this, this variety, these various images of God. You know, I, I love chapter 18 of, of Genesis where, Mm. Where God says, I'm going to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah because yeah. they're bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I, I think maybe I should tell Abraham first because I did say to Abraham, through you, everybody's going to be blessed. So I got, I've got to really make it okay with Abraham uh -huh. for him to go wipe him out. So, I mean, yeah. there's, there's a marvelous kind of uh, humorous and, and, and creatively free way of dealing with those issues. And then Job has that exactly the same thing. You get the same story with Moses when he comes down with the Ten Commandments and God says, hey, these guys have been worshiping the golden calf. I'm going to destroy all of them and start over with you. What do you think, Moses? And Moses is like, that's a terrible idea. No, you're not going to do that. <laughs> this is like a theme throughout the Bible. And we tend to think like we I've been taught uh, throughout much of my life. You shouldn't argue with God. Right. Yes, right. You, that's through. That's the whole deal is like yeah. this arguing and conversation with God. Job yeah. does it. Moses does it. Abraham does it. It's like it's part of the whole point. OK, so um, we've got like 10 minutes left. So, so we haven't talked this, about anything you said we were going to talk about. But anyway, so so uh, we we wanted to talk about Daniel because your book in uh, your book in the chapter on Daniel just I, it felt like a shift. For me, I've been I've been studying with you and reading your books and uh, all of this stuff with Gerard and nonviolence in the Bible. But Daniel was super helpful for me as you were talking about it. Can you tell us a little bit about the book of Daniel? Well, Daniel is a beautiful book and it's a pivotal book in for Christians, for Jesus and, and for Christians as a result because it kind of occupies a necessary space in the span between 
uh, Isaiah, and we talked about second Isaiah and the servant, this figure uh, uh, who who makes many righteous um, through uh, his knowledge, uh, through what he reveals. Um, uh, and it occupies a pivotal space between that and Jesus. So uh, Daniel is written as if it took place in the sixth and, and uh, uh, well, uh, the sixth and early fifth centuries and, and under the Babylonians and, and the Persians. But it, it's obviously, but all scholars agree, it's, it's a prophecy after the event. It's written mm -hmm. as if, but it's meant to describe, it's, it's a, piece of literature that that is intended to describe this present crisis that you're in in overarching um biblical and at this point we say apocalyptic terms and then in other words it's revealing apocalyptic apocalyptic means a revelation it's it's drawing back the curtains and it reveals the nature of what you're going through it's not it's not saying oh we all we knew this I mean, part of the payoff of the book, obviously, is that this is all, all already known beforehand. Yes, I mean, that, that helps to settle you down, that this is not a surprise to, to God's people. But the, 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 the most important point is, is the character of what's happening, is the nature of what's happening. So what's happening in the second century? Because you have to parallel, and you have to kind of basically read um, my, my chapter to see how the book of the books of the Maccabees, first and two, first and second Maccabees, parallel the events uh, that are also described in uh, the book of Daniel. In other words, you're looking at the the Syrian or Antiochian uh, crisis that happened under a, this guy, this king, Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth of Syria, who was one of the successor uh, regimes of Alexander the Great from the fourth century now alexander the great himself was someone who was who brought militarism and imperialism to a height that had never been known before and he completely changed the ancient world and largely um is israel or judea that what was left of israel judea remained largely unscathed because they were under the egyptians under the egyptian successors the ptolemies until the second century and then this this kind of basically cultural war began. This this uh, this war of uh, Hellenistic culture against Judaic culture, and there was an attempt. And it's it's dis it's discussed by scholars as, as as to how serious Antiochus Epiphanes was about it, and how much it was like it was actual native Jews who the, who themselves wanted to accommodate and to assimilate to Hellenistic culture, and, and they made power grabs at the same time. That's the historical background, and it's a little bit confused, but we do know that there was a war uh, on the part of a Hellenizing um, nation, the, the, the Syrians, the, uh, uh, from Anti um, uh, ruled by Antiochus, and then this group called the, the Maccabees. And they, they reacted ferociously. They... They conducted a guerrilla war, a very, very effective guerrilla war for three and a half years, two times a time and then a half a time. You know, it, that's mm -hmm. that's the, the kind of measure, the measurement of the time that you get in in Daniel. So, you know, you're kind of dealing with the same the same um, uh, experiences. But they conducted this very effective uh, guerrilla war, which basically drove back the uh, the, the Hellenists, the, 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 uh, the Syrians and establish their own regime so that and that's very important for, for Jesus's own time because Herod Herod the Great who you know is, is accounted as the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem and then his his son Herod Antipas these were the remnants of that regime the the, the Maccabean or it's known Hasmonean regime so there was a rebellion a, a nationalistic it was a nationalistic it was because if you have a cultural war <laughs> as we know if yeah. someone tries to wipe out your culture you're going to have a nationalist rebellion against it you know you're going you're going to stir up that sense it's an identitarian rebellion you know mm. and of course we know about all that yeah. and that's what the Maccabees are at exactly the same juncture the book of daniel is written and there's not a peep about 
fun and rebellion in there. Instead, the wise shall fall by the sword, and they should be deserted, and they fall, and they they will suffer plunder and flame. But um, at the resurrection, when uh, and that comes that what that bit I quoted there is chapter eleven, and, then, and at chapter twelve, at the resurrection they shall shine like the sky, like and like the stars of the sky, because they have they have. Uh, instructed many in righteousness, just like this, this. So there's an echo there of the suffering servant, of the servant of of um, uh, of Isaiah. So you you have this apocalyptic river vision, and we're used to thinking of apocalypse as as highly violent, <laughs> but this is a non-violent apocalypse, and the figure at the heart of this non-violent apocalypse is one like a son of man, hmm. chapter seven. I mean, I, it's so beautiful because you've got these beasts. They're horrendous, like Marvel Universe level beasts arising out of the abyss. That is the kind of non-place of history where all destruction and and, and violence comes from. Uh, and, and one after another, uh, they all arise. And the, and the last one, which is paralleled with the Greeks, with, with Alexander the Great, you know the, the, the connections are there if you if you read the text is the worst of them all so you've got this progressive accumulation and escalation of violence now god this a throne is set up <laughs> on, on on wheels of fire the ancient one appears and another and this other name is used for god uh, the ancient one not mm -hmm. yahweh and there's, there's something to think about there. You need to go back. It's like the like the story is going is digging into the depth the depth of of of, of God's identity again, <laughs> digging it up. And then one like a son of man is brought into the ancient one's presence, and all authority and dominion and power and um, meaning is given to this one like a son of man. Now the contrast is evident between the the fangs and the horns and the claws and the iron and the destructive potential of the beasts and this one who appears just like a naked woman or man mm. a baby you know mm. and all of, so it's evident that there's there's something disarmed about the son of man now all the all the scholarship that i i've you know like we all gave so much time to try to figure out whether Jesus really did say, um, or not, don't say, I am the Son of Man, but that uh, I connect himself in terms of meaning and identity with the Son of Man. All that is, is because, because the Son of Man has been associated with violent judgment, and they wanted to get that, they wanted to, the scholars, or some scholars wanted to get rid of that, um, and not, un, not unreasonably so, but. That is not the. That's not the issue. The, not, the, the, the new the New Testament issue is not whether Jesus verbally said this, which, which is what the New, new Testament uh, scholars tried to figure out. It's what the identity that's at yes. stake in that figure yeah. is. You see this playing out in the figure of Jesus. You see how he and he, he his what he does, and and this is this is key part of of the, of the chapter on 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 uh, Jesus. Is that he goes to the temple and he shuts it down. He doesn't clean it up. He doesn't sweep it up busily, getting all the all mm -hmm. the sheep poop out of there, you know, like whatever it is, or get rid of the money because that's disgusting stuff. I mean, yes, you know, money and religion, you know, they they're notoriously um, corrupt uh, bedfellows, but that's not what's at stake. What's at stake is shutting down sacrifice itself. Mm. And they say, um, where do you get the authority to do this from? He has to get it from somewhere. I mean, he would. So what, what I'm claiming here is that the action in the temple is as historically founded as anything in the Gospels. And most scholars would agree. But it's too so shocking and so counterculture. You don't go around messing up temple. Who today goes into a, a church and starts, you know, turning things over, you know, Unless, unless it's the Reformation and people are really, really upset, mm -hmm. right? and, and, and it's a bad Catholics kind of thing. But, um, you know, these are sacred spaces. Jesus is going into the sacred space and he's taking over 
and uh, he's 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 stopping the sacrificial process because without the money, without the animals that we get driven out in 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 John, you cannot have sacrifice. So he's making an incredibly powerful intervention. He's shutting down the main engine. He's shut, you're in this spacecraft, this religious spacecraft, floating to God knows what future, and he and he and he sabotages the main engine. This so is this this. this Dina, Dina is asking this. How do you reconcile Jesus in this moment, creating the whip and whipping everybody out with the message of love and nonviolence? That well, that, I mean, that, that's that's the, the point. I, if we look at it externally, we look at it from like, oh, yeah, the whip and overturning the tables. We say, well, Jesus has this enormous hissy fit. You know, let's go to get him killed. I mean, for someone as profound in his thinking and his and his spiritual identity as, as Jesus is just not credible. What is credible is that this is a, a totally thought through, deliberate, cognitive act on his part that has a determinative and um, what I would think was a, 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 an intentionally definitive effect. In other words, he, he wants to call a halt physically to the temple. Now, he took the whip, yes, and people say, oh, yes, you use, if you've ever cracked a whip over animals, I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Mm. Um, you know, I've seen it, I've seen you, and whip, animals hate whips. Mm. All you just crack the whip and they'll start running. All you had to do was that, it was crack that whip and the animals would start bolting and there would be confusion and, and, and mayhem. He did create mayhem, but no one actually gets physically hurt that we know of it's just these the the institution starts to to collapse and this is what gets him killed in mark's gospel he says and thereafter they began to look up for a way of to destroy him because the people hung on his words the people know i mean like you don't have tv you don't have movies right. but you do have jerusalem and if you've got a prophet going in there doing stuff like this everybody is going to be oh man this is the best show in town way better than that and they're going to look at what's going to happen next so jesus is de definitely conscious so so yes it's a it's a very um dramatic theater conducted by jesus and that's what it is there's no doubt about it uh but to interpret it from the outside as uh, as acts of violence is childish to interpret it from the inside as 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 a an intentional well thought through, deliberate and transformative act on Jesus' part changes it completely and says, okay, Jesus now is engaging with, and, and Adam asked me this question beforehand, so I, I did prepare it. If you think about Einstein, Einstein changed the story of physics. I don't understand it very well, but I know he did. Uh -huh. you know, he, saw, he saw Newtonian physics completely different, but the way he changed it was through math. You know, he was just this, genius you could figure out the math of things you know if you're going to change the human story the core human story you can't do it with math you have to do it with symbolism you have to do it by an enacted story that that tells everybody what really is going on so when jesus uh creates this trans transformative story of shutting down the temple which is a very bad story as far as the priests are concerned and the people would have thought, would have said, oh, my God, what is this? I mean, mm. what can follow on from this? It just has to be some incredibly violent rebellion. That's the way they would think. But yeah. no, Jesus yeah. Jesus is then going to allow himself to be taken captive. And that's the marvel. That's the, the miraculous thing, you know, that he's going to allow this then to play out in terms of his arrest and crucifixion. He knows he knows the consequences and it, he will get handed over to the Romans. I mean, like it. It was the politically obvious thing that was going to happen. So he, 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 he understood what was going but he did it in order to change the core story and to change it as, I believe, one like a human being who is not going to retaliate, who is not going to repeat the same motif mm. on, on a higher plane. Okay, God, now it's your turn to come in and get me off the cross or if I'm going to die, wipe at least wipe out my enemies, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. None of that happens. He changed changes the core story, and that is that for me is 
that uh, that's apocalyptic. It's revelatory. I mean, I I don't know anything uh, in the biblical narrative leading up in all the things we've just talked about that is so gripping as that sequence. Mm. Mm. I uh, do you have a do you have a couple extra minutes because I yeah, just sure. I love this. Sure, yeah. this is fantastic. So I have to go pick up my wife uh, at uh, at four o'clock. That's it. Okay, we we will we'll be done in less than an hour. So <laughs> <laughs> we we don't have that much time left. But but uh, what you do next in the book is talk about Paul, and I wanted to get Paul in here because Paul is sometimes viewed by many of us as reverting. Uh, back to something or going against Jesus, not not understanding what Jesus is about in this nonviolent way. So oftentimes yeah, right. Romans chapter 13 is used yeah. as a way, whereas Jesus may have like um, gone to the temple and uh, tried to subvert the system. Paul is reconstructing the system that Jesus came to lead us away from. Uh, and so you do something like you, you say that Paul is continuing this revelation of divine nonviolence of God. Can you talk a little bit about how Paul does that? Sure. I mean, um, Paul himself is a remarkable figure. There's, he's astonishing really. Um, and his story is astonishing because he kind of gets converted very early on this, this this is something that is not often recognized paul is if, if we if we assess jesus's death which is 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 there are various um uh candidates for the actual death but generally it's 30 a.d you know 30 ce you know um it could be 33 could be 34 but uh i i tend to think it's 30 you know uh and then working back from paul's own um his own uh, letters, especially Galatians, um, Paul is converted somewhere between 32 and 34. So G Paul is converted to Jesus in a big way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, like there's there's no one who kind of gets, I think, gets Jesus as th that Paul, like Paul does. And, and Paul recognizes, I think, you know, Paul, Paul, what we have it in Acts, we don't have it in his letters. Um, why you why are you inflicting violence on me? You know, that's what the, the Lucan tradition has. But Paul gets converted and he recognizes the uh he ultimately recognizes the consequences of of what this of what this means, of of this 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 unworthy, unclean, non-approved messiah, you know, like he got crucified <laughs> yeah and this is what paul hates you know can't have a messiah like that you know this is this is basically a disgusting aberration he he he, he gets transformed to someone who believes this and then he sees the consequences of this as he goes through now there is this period between um his his uh his uh conversion in the year 34 and the year 49 so that's 15 years later when he begins which he which he talks about uh in galatians when he he goes to jerusalem the second time and that you calculate back those 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 years that that uh, amount of time um that paul seems to have been un, uh, uh uh developing the understanding of the consequences of what he'd seen and what he'd experienced i mean it makes sense that you'd you don't have, you know, two thousand years theology behind you. You have this. You have these events, and they come in sideways. Like I say, everything comes in sideways. They don't. It doesn't come in vertically, you know, so that it all. And we all want to think any authoritarian system, any hierarchical system, wants mm. to think vertically, wants to think down the line. But this is Jesus is coming in sideways. He meets Paul on the road, road to Damascus, and then Paul has to think this through. And then in the year 49, you know, if we reconstruct it, um, the, the authorities, those who are accounted pillars of the church in Jerusalem, those who they say, I mean, Paul is being sarcastic here. I mean, Paul is quite sarcastic, you know. I don't want to cross Paul. He's, <laughs> you know, he's a sarky person. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and he said, these are accounted pillars of the church. Not, not that I, I count anybody as having an authority because I get my authority directly from Jesus mm -hmm. who's entered sideways into my world and, and turned it around. 
He says, but I, I did not want to, I did not want my, my, my course to be run in vain, which means to say he doesn't want to set up an alternative Christianity right there. You know, he doesn't want to set, set up a schismatic Christianity because he knows it comes from that sequence. We have to maintain the, uh, the physical communicative sequence with Jesus and with his followers. That's essentially can't be at, out of Paul's head. And he sees that's very important. And that's a kind of lesson for us, you know, how we, we have to struggle to retain, to keep uh, communion between to, between our different our different groups. But he says, OK, right now I've got to go ahead. You know, I can go ahead and, and preach my gospel. So he goes off and he returns to Asia Minor um, uh, and he has a full confidence in his gospel at that point. So then he uh, in, in, in my book. Uh, I, and I'm getting an awful lot of this from this scholar called Douglas Campbell, mm -hmm. uh, who wrote, has written very significantly on on Paul. And I, you know, full full uh, uh, a credit to this to that writer and, and to his his recreation of that sequence. But Campbell puts then the letters to the Ephesians and Colossians, what we call the letters to the Ephesians and and and, and Colossians, um, directly after that. So Paul is at the height of his. Um, sense of of his gospel and of his applicability to the world that he's that he's going back to uh, to, to the greek world now we have always seen romans as the key to, to to paul we've seen it because uh it's the longest letter it comes first in in the biblical sequence uh and and it was really length that it, that determined which letters got became first and romans appears to have a legal um, structure to it that uh, righteousness vindication before God comes by faith rather than works you know, and we know how that is so important in the, in the Reformation so it's really this kind of contractual um, like, uh, contractual function of faith that it, it puts us in contact with a God who has declared righteousness in the world through Jesus and it's basically that once you, once you get that you're good and where you're good for it's not so much here, it's for the hereafter. You don't want to burn in hell for all eternity. So once you've got this faith in, in, in God's righteousness. But Paul, that's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about a transformation of the human case, of the human situation. And I'm going to read here the bit in Ephesians. So, so it's important to get Paul right. You have to put Ephesians first and Romans next. And then you understand Romans through Ephesians. But you're going to read. Did you want to say something, uh, Adam? No, but I think you're getting at this question that Dina has asked. She asks, but doesn't Paul contradict Jesus repeatedly? And uh, I, I think what, what you're getting at, you're going to get at something of an answer to that question here. I mean, this is its own podcast, Dina. Yes, it <laughs> that is. You're, that you're leading us towards. Yeah. But Douglas Campbell has done amazing work on helping us uh um, unlearn things that we have been taught about Paul and yeah. uh, relearn. And that's one of the things that you're helping us uh, do now. So, right. I mean, yes, you have to say that Paul is pragmatic and that's another part of his, and, and we have to think about what's I've said, what I'm certainly going to say now, you have to think about that. But the first thing is, is to listen to this. This is Ephesians chapter two. And it, and it, and it when I, when I put all these, when I, I fitted the pieces together, the, the, this, Kind of poked me in the eye, kind of like it was like a fist shot out of the text and poked me in the eye. It says, "But now in Christ Jesus, so chapter two, verse thirteen. Now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now we've been used to seeing that blood in atonement and legal terms. This is the payment, right? So we're our accounts are squared. But Paul is not talking in legal terms. This that was invented a thousand years afterwards." What he's talking about is a phenomenology, a phenomenon of nonviolence that broke into the world and the, and the blood of Christ, the blood of Jesus is um, a kind of metonym. It's, it's one word for that mm -hmm. whole thing. It's a metonym for the, the nonviolent revelation that came in, that came in Jesus. So when he says that uh, we've been brought near these, this, this is, these are the Greeks, these are the Gentiles uh, in the, by the blood of Christ. We were far off, right? We weren't part of the promises. Now we've been brought near. How are you brought near? For he is our peace. 
In his flesh, he has made us both. He has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. In his flesh, he has made us one. He's brought in his flesh, which is the, the crucified flesh. He is uh, broken down the divide. So these divisions that naturally occur between human beings, like, like I'm white. I'm black, I'm Greek, I'm Jewish, I'm man, I'm woman, all this stuff. I'm Scythian, I'm slave. You know, Paul repeats this overcoming of divisions in Galatians and in and in Colossians. So these are all, I say that that shows they're all they're all in the same time frame. He's broken down those dividing walls because this is a phenomenon. This is a this is a phenomenon that is that has entered into human experience. Oh my goodness, mm -hmm. because that blood is infinitely non-retaliatory, there can't be no, there can't be any walls between us. Um, he has abolished the law with his commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity. I mean, like he's saying it, play. Uh, uh, Ephesians has been marginalized. It really has been pushed, physically pushed off. To, the, to either the latter career of Paul or some disciple of Paul. But it's just, it's Romans derives from this. The, the, um, the uh, uh, righteousness through faith derives from this breaking down of walls. Mm -hmm. So that there's no need for these uh, defining, identifying practices of Judaism, like circumcision, like the, the food ordinances. There's no need for that. Because it's this relationship with this new humanity that that Jesus has created, and that you enter into once you be, you have a relationship with it, and that's what faith is: is having the you, you're having a mimetic and imitative relationship with Jesus' own relationship with 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 the world, with humanity, with history. That is a non-violent relationship. You you imitate that. So there's these three imitations going on. Jesus imitates the Father. Um, and well, that's that's two. Jesus imitates the Father, and we imitate Jesus. But we imitate it uh, in those in those profound transformative um, senses that 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 change humanity from violent humanity to nonviolent mm. humanity. Uh, in place, so that that he might create in himself one humanity in place of the two, thus making peace. I mean, how many times do you have to say it, right? Mm -hmm. And might reconcile both groups, reconcile at one both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it, putting to death that violence through it. Now, that's plain as the nose on your face, I think, or at least mm -hmm. it, it, when mm -hmm. I got hit in the eye by it, it was as plain <laughs> as the nose on my face. face. Um, that, that, is, that is Paul's core gospel. And what happens when he gets to Romans is that he's encountering another teacher. And this is, this is Douglas Campbell. And it's very important. I mean, as 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 Adam says, you kind of need um, you need you need a, a podcast on that because Paul is countering the teaching of the the teacher, which does say that God's violence is still in play. So just let me show. Just I mean, this is a stunning uh, 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 contig contiguity of, of of verses in Romans chapter uh, one, verse seventeen and eighteen. And this is this is Campbell's core, core argument. Uh, there, there's there's two um, alternative theses being uh, theses of theology being announced here. Uh, Adam, you want to say something? I just want to tell Dina and everybody who has issues with Paul to listen very carefully what to what Tony is about to say, because uh, what Tony is about to say has shifted a whole lot of my understanding of Paul and his redeemed Paul, uh, especially Romans chapter one and all of those verses oh, that, stuff, yeah. that are used against uh, our Asian, LGBTQIA yeah. siblings. This is the false teacher uh, who right. is using religion as an excuse to accuse other people. And Paul, uh, we have confused Paul with the false teacher. So I don't want to like tell people what you're about to tell people, but I just told people what you're about to tell them. <laughs> so no, I'm you're really sorry, right. Tony. I mean, a, but it, this it is, is a, like huge, huge New Testament 
stuff that as you're saying, like we are moving thousands of miles an hour into yeah. the future within like years. Uh, yes. this is, yes. That's what Douglas Campbell is doing. Uh, yeah, and so this is just crucially important. For the, uh, um, Romans, the deliverance of God is astonishing. And, and it is a, a game changer at the, at the, at the most profound level. It really does. And, uh, and, you know, I, 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 I didn't read it initially. I thought that nothing could be that powerful. I mean, because people were saying this about it and I was skeptical, but then I began to realize it makes so much sense that there are, there are two voices here. There's the voice of the teacher and then, and which Paul is, is reiterating in this, in this kind of rhetorical practice of a speech in person. He's given the teaching of this person and it does make sense because Paul does it elsewhere. You know, he re rehearses what other people say. And uh, he's given the teaching of this, this person in order to counter it. Now, Paul is, as I say, he's, Paul is a, is a peacemaker and he's a pragmatist at the same time. You know, he doesn't want to set people off in the wrong direction, but he's going to carry through his argument, you know, and he's going to carry it through in the best way he can. And he does it by deconstructing. Campbell shows how he piece by piece he deconstructs the that that Jesus that God is no longer about wrath, uh, but about this revelation of a transformative humanity that we just read about in in Ephesians. So this is um, Romans chapter one verses uh, uh, seventeen to eighteen, and and this sums it up. For in it, and he says, I'm just in the previous verse, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Okay. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Now, you have to put in parenthesis there that faith also means faithfulness. And that's part of the, uh, the etym etymology of, of pistis and, and, its, um, and its Hebrew background as well, that uh, the 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 so, so you have two instances of faith there god is revealed through for faith through faith for faith which makes no sense if faith is just the individual contractual agreement of the individual there yeah i accept that jesus is my lord and savior you know it, god is revealed and you can't reveal god through that contractual agreement it has to be god is revealed through the faithfulness of jesus for the faithfulness of the believer. That is, God is revealed in that sequence. He's through Jesus on the blood of the cross, revealing this new nonviolent humanity for the sake of an equivalent fidelity, holding true to that revelation of, of a nonviolent God in the believer. So faith is revealed for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faithfulness. And then in verse 18, like, and it's kind of the, probably the most uh, vertiginous, seasicky shift in verses in the whole Bible. <laughs> it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. You have the two. One is the revelation of God through faith, which is the faithfulness of Jesus. But then. We don't have the revelation of God. We have the wrath of God in the present tense, which normally, as Campbell points out, should be the future. The wrath of God, the wrath of God will come down on you for what you're doing. But he's talking about the teaching of the, the teacher who says the wrath of God is, he's the, the teacher is revealing the wrath of God in the present tense come down from heaven against. So it's a present tense teaching, as we know, that preachers can do. They can do a present tense teaching of the wrath of God to scare the wits out of you. And Paul has the alternative thesis just before it um, that the righteousness of God is revealed by the fidelity of the Messiah on the cross through his blood, which we understand from and which will get picked up in chapter three of, of, of Romans anyway. So we have these two what is emerging today is this incredible thesis that Paul has always had of this transformation of the roots of our humanity. Now, as I say, he's pragmatic and he, he doesn't, he doesn't use the kind of language that I'm using here because he's, he's trying to, he, he's trying to deconstruct at the same time as offer this kind of uh, incredibly difficult 
uh, teaching, and which is that he kind of uh, he, he mentions the the comeback to it. Are you saying that we can sin, and mm -hmm. and and don't there be no consequences? You know, and so and we should sin more. So that he said, no, 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 I'm not saying that. Although you might see that as as the consequence of saying there's this infinite nonviolence of God. No, this is a transformative thing that's meant to through faith for the sake of faith. Through through the fidelity of Christ, giving uh, rise to my own fidelity to this transformative uh, phenomenon. Um, he's saying that's what's at stake. It's, you're mistaking the reality of this. It, it's gentle and and uh, um, pragmatic, trying to to overturn the teacher's voice. And then in chapter thirteen of Romans, where you know, which is is quoted as as vindication as of the civil sword. Um, it's the kind of same thing. I mean, I take Paul, I take Paul as having switched from an imminent, and this is kind of important, you, and I don't develop it very much, but um, it is important that the Paul has switched from an imminent second coming of Jesus that you get in the very earliest letters, first and, se and second Thessalonians. So you have to see these in sequence, and that comes before Ephesians and Colossians. He changes it into a world historical transformation. He, he then understands that that this is that God that Jesus has broken down all these walls of hostility between I say even male and female you get it in in um, and between genders you know mm -hmm. that will be a consequence of it that you see in, in Galatians so Paul has Paul himself has grown now the the issue of 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 um, uh, chapter chapter thirteen of, of Romans is that in the interim <laughs> like. There is no massive institution. I mean, you tried to get it in the Middle Ages. With, the, with the, There's no massive institution imposing this transformation on anyone. You still have yeah. the Roman Empire. You still have crime. And he's saying, and you still have war. He's saying, um, and it's, this is a Jewish perspective, and you get it in Habakkuk, the, the prophet, that God has appointed these, these um, agencies to to as a kind of interim and you get Paul has the same view about the law as an interim regime as a kind of kind of interim dispensation but and and so in yes that there Paul Vindy or Paul accepts that the the civil authority has this power to suppress evil by the traditional ways in which it's been done but he doesn't say that you as a Christian should do that he just mm -hmm. says that he says he says that the, the, the and there was no thought of that at that time he, right. they, they, the christians were going to be a different ilk they're going to be a different kind of human being but in the interim yes rome still exists and the civil authority still exists and that is that is the the the, the nature of history after after jesus it's a kind of interim history and and paul uh, speaks elsewhere about it uh, that you know, if you want to get married, act as if you're not married. If you want to, if you want to trade in the world, act as if you. And, the, and you have to unpack that. But he says that we're we're in these two uh, phases of time that are overlapped. But in the meantime, in this fidelity, this faith, this relationship with Jesus, everything is transformed. Everything is different. Everything is new. That the, all the authorities, all the powers, have been submitted. To Christ, He's been raised up in the heavenly places above all the powers, and that is because this, this, and this is the key thing, really. To under, this is what the gospel is, you know. This, and this is really, you know, can you accept that? Can you believe it? Rather mm. than kind of moralize the whole thing, you know, like, you know, Jesus is cool because you know he's because he's cool, right? Yeah, yeah. But you know, <laughs> um, that that Paul got things wrong, uh, and and we are kind of morally superior to him. Because we see, see things from a kind of morally elevated, kind of two thousand year later point of view, but rather no, that there's this gospel which is problematic just for everyone because you have to live in the world. You have to you have yeah. to find some way forward in the world. The gospel is that God has declared all human bets off. The way in which we organize our lives are not the way that God wants, and He means that radically. Now you commit as that's the gospel. Come and follow me. You know, come. Mm. Uh, believe in me um uh do you do you do you believe in me do you do you, do you have a relationship with my relationship <laughs> can you can you imitate that relationship in yourself 
if you can, if you well, if you feel you can, because I know nine times out of ten, if not ninety-nine times out of a hundred, I don't. Yep, yep. But I do certainly feel that I like this mm -hmm, <laughs> and I want mm -hmm. it, and I and I feel that I can. If you feel that I can, well, you know, start. Yep. You know, act act on it right now in any way you can. You know, in, you're not going to be. It's not going to be perfect. It's mm -hmm. not going to change the world overnight. But it's it it's that transform. What do we do when we pray? When when we get come together, as Christians, you know, as, uh, uh, and somebody preaches, we do it in order to reactivate, re-energize that fundamental, that core transformation that is becoming a Christian. I love it. I love it, um, Tony. Thank you. Thank you for this. And thank you for coming uh, half an hour longer than I asked you to. <laughs> it's awesome. It is always a joy. Well, thank you, Adam. I really appreciate it because, you know, I don't get many opportunities to do this, to, to rant on. To, <laughs> I've to always the, loved your ranting, my friend. I always learned so much. Dina, <laughs> Dina, says, uh, Dina says, I think my brain is full. I need to reflect on a lot. <laughs> and so, Tony, you've given us a lot to reflect on. Once again, the uh, the book is Signs of Change, the Bible's Evolution of Divine Nonviolence. Highly recommend it. Uh, the, the other book that we've been talking about is uh, here, The Deliverance of God, an apocalyptic rereading of justification in Paul. And yes, Dina, uh, what we are getting at here is that... Uh, Romans chapter one, where it's all about the uh, the anti LGBTQ uh, stuff. Uh, apparently, anti, apparently. Yeah. yeah, anti this, anti that. That's the false teacher. Uh, right. And if you want to deep, deep, and, and the, you're going. Go if you want to deep dive into it, it's about a thousand pages <laughs> yeah. of uh, Douglas Campbell talking about uh, how this is all worked out. And Tony has given us the key, which is Ephesians, where it says. Christ has broken down the dividing wall of hostility between us. Anytime we recreate or you think that Paul is recreating the dividing wall of hostility, that's the false teacher. And we all get caught up in the false teacher, right? We all start resurrecting these dividing walls between us and them. It's human to get caught up in that. But Jesus, Paul knows, is deconstructing that, is destroying the dividing wall so that we uh, don't uh, keep creating it. And Tony, you have given us so much to think about, so much uh, wisdom and great stuff. It is always a pleasure and a joy to see you, my friend. Thank you. For Thank you, Adam. Here. Thank you so much. I'm surprised, Adam, doing all this. You still have all your hair. How'd you do that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, if if I had a such a good looking head as yours, I would shave it off. So, uh, <laughs> but but you you look good without the hair, my friend. So right. Right. <laughs> it's good. Thank you, everybody, right. for being Thank here. You, Thank you. Thank you for your comments and your questions. We will do this all next week with Ramal Tune. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, masculinity. Uh, how to be a man in this world and navigate it in a non-toxic, uh, healthy way as possible. So join us next week uh, with Ramal Tune for that. And uh, friends, thank you again for being here. You can keep up with all of the one questions with Pastor Adam wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you listen on iTunes, uh, if you could leave a nice five-star review, that would be fantastic. Uh, and we will do this all again next week live here on the Clackamas United Church of Christ Facebook page and the Pastor Adam Facebook page. Until then, everybody, God be with you.